Thank you very much. Um, Kate Carpenter, thank you for the invitation and also to, to Beth Layton. Thank you very much for extending the invitation. Uh, Beth <clears throat> deserves more than my thanks for the invitation. Over the course of two or three phone calls, which were long and rambling, she managed to come up with a title for my presentation and a synopsis. <laughs> so watch me now as I completely eviscerate her good work. The, the, affordable, the passage of the Patient Protection and Affordable, Affordable Act has laid the groundwork for reform in a number of areas. Universal insurance coverage has been the most publicized, but there's much more to this law. The act provides for insurance exchanges, accountable care organizations, patient-centered outcomes research, health literacy programs, physician quality reporting initiatives, and of course, electronic medical records. The focus of my talk today is gonna to focus more on patient-centered care and clinical ethics as relates to evidence-based medicine and electronic health records. Individuals with low levels of health literacy are the least equipped to benefit from the Affordable Care Act. Uh, with potentially costly consequences for both those who pay for and deliver their care, as well as for the patients themselves. Rates of low literacy are disproportionately high among lower income Americans eligible for publicly financed care through Medicare and Medicaid. This pattern is likely to extend to individual, individuals newly, newly eligible for, for Medicaid and those involved in the subsidized private insurance uh, plan through the state-based exchanges. For this reason, the Act provides for literacy programs in a number of areas. As we can see, limited health literacy is, is pervasive. Um, it's a pervasive problem in the United States that requires an extensive and multifaceted response and approaches. Rates of limited health literacy range from, uh, depending <coughs> on the reports, from one third to one half of the population. Some accounts of these estimates are optimistic when considering the type of knowledge that's required to make a truly informed choice a truly autonomous informed choice. One report commissioned by the IOM suggests that only 12% of Americans actually are, have proficient health literacy. The National Library of Medicine's Healthy People 2010 objectives relate to health literacy and they represent two parts of the larger communication issue. Um, Objective number one of this report is to improve the health literacy of persons with inadequate or marginal literacy skills. And uh, section number 11.6 is to increase the proportion of, of persons who report that their health care provider has satisfactory communication skills. Improving the health literacy for patients in hospital environment is largely related to the materials available and the communication skills of the providers who are giving care to the patient. So the problem of limited health literacy has to be tackled from both sides, from the patient perspective and the provider perspective. The definition I have up here incorporates the sense that literacy extends beyond simply being able to read and write and includes <coughs> comprehension and practical use of information that's provided. For patients' purposes, health literacy includes the ability to locate medical facility, facilities, schedule and keep appointments, describe, monitor, measure symptoms, follow prescribed medication regimen, adjust medications and treatment as needed, and seek care where appropriate. Well, nowhere in this definition do we consider the degree to which clinicians have the capacity to communicate this information in a meaningful way to patients. The burden is placed wholly upon the patient, who is labeled illiterate if she cannot meet the standard definition, and therefore is stigmatized. Health literacy is a product of the provider-patient relationship, and the problems that exist in this relationship create barriers to literacy. We look at the result in this definition, we look at the result, burden the victims of circumstance rather than the systems and dynamic relationships that make up health institutions, clinical encounters, and discourse in general. <clears throat> 
As described by Somers and Mahadevan, the U.S. healthcare system with its myriad public and private programs, institutions, services, products, and information poses a significant challenge to those seeking access to affordable quality healthcare. Understanding the complexities of insurance eligibility, therapeutic guidance, medical technology, prescription medication, disease management, prevention, and lifestyle modification are difficult for any person, let alone one with compromised level of literacy or numeracy. An individual seeking to participate meaningfully and successfully in the health system requires a constellation of skills, reading and writing, basic mathematical calculation, speaking, listening, networking, and rhetoric, the totality of which we define as health literacy. If that weren't enough, the shifting sands of ethical benefits and burdens is complicated in the context of health literacy. Low literacy is prevalent among those with low education levels the elderly, minorities, and those living with chronic diseases. The literature describes myriad health consequences of limited literacy. It's a risk factor for worse health status, <coughs> hospitalization, and mortality. Increased incidence of chronic illness and in, um, increased incidence of chronic illness and decreased use of preventive services. The shift towards shared decision-making and patient autonomy has served to exacerbate this complexity of a healthcare system that is not well suited to those with low literacy. Many people who suffer from liter literacy barriers would not be so limited if the system had, or if the system would be simplified. In terms of ethics, addressing health literacy has a basis in the following ethical principles, autonomy, making accessible information that will allow for shared decision making. And the, the other theory which underpins is the theory of justice, which looks at how the complexity of healthcare and the assumption of high literacy negatively affects people with limited literacy, uh, limited literacy skills and promotes health disparities. For example, the, actual, the average reading level for the American adult is somewhere between the eighth and ninth grade. But the average, reading level of, of things that are printed for patient education is about a high school senior level or greater. Thus, under a theory of justice, the reformation of health, the health <coughs> system would include elevation of patient literacy and education as a core function of providers. Right now, it appears health literacy is assumed because education appears to be contingent upon a patient asking and comprehension is 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 not evaluated as often as it should. What Valandes and Pash Arlo argue here is that that standard needs to be flipped on its head, that the default presumption needs to be that people do not have health literacy. And um, so that, that universal assumption of limited literacy would actually be closer to accurate if we look at some of the, the literature. Understanding is a two-way street. It can't just be the, the, the patients who have to educate themselves in order to have healthcare accessible to them. But, you know, even if they had access, I wonder if we're setting unrealistic expectations for providers. This is an awful lot of information and diversity out there. Having a handle on everything all at once, scientific and clinical innovation, cultural competence, and sound clinical judgment is a tall order. Even if we have all of the information, it does not equate to knowledge. Providers and patients alike need education and information management that new, so that new information can be found, integrated, and be put into truly meaningful use. Data, information, and knowledge, and wisdom are very, very different things. Pouring on information and data does not alone create knowledge. Information must be tailored, channeled, and delivered in a way that meets the patient where she is. As a high bar, as high as a bar as this is for clinicians, it's exponentially, exponentially higher for vulnerable patients, as are the stakes. Data and information are not enough. At some point, patients require some intermediary agent to help them transform the deluge of information into knowledge in a way that's meaningful in the patient's terms. This is the duty of physici physicians. If George Bernard Shaw's famous quote is apropos here, all, that all professions are a conspiracy against the laity, then it is the medical community that is responsible for making the rest of us vulnerable and ignorant in order to maintain its monopoly on clinical practice. Does anybody know what the definition of doctor is? 
Anybody? It comes from the, the Latin word docere, 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 and it means teacher. It doesn't mean <coughs> healer. And if patients are illiterate, then it could be argued that physicians are not fully meeting their charge as doctors. If physicians are only supposed to provide clinical care without education, then they're little more than biological technicians. And I don't think anybody wants that. It doesn't fit within the social contract, and it certainly doesn't work towards the benefit of patients and the public. In the traditional flow of information in a clinical counter, the patient shares her experience of the phenomena of, and, and life history, and of course money, in exchange for care, building knowledge to improve health, and of course confidentiality of information. <coughs> That's the way it worked. Calling clinicians <coughs> doctors pays homage to this vital exchange of information. Now, we expect much more from patients. It's almost as if autonomy were an obligation as opposed to a right. And as a result, a host of barriers have raised up. Um, there, medical language is, is very, very complex. Even the manner in which doctors communicate to each other, to patients, in, in vulnerable states can be confusing. Physicians have their own biases with regard to the way to treat clinical care. It could be their own personal religious views that inform the way that they deliver care. And then, of course, there are social barriers and status within a hospital alone, which is a very hierarchical environment, which doctors and surgeons maintain hold over the top. It creates a very difficult power arrangement for patients to, to, to break through. And then there's the manner of the physician's cultural competency or an ability to relate to the patient where she is. And then, of course, the patient's own agency and sense of her own agency can be a barrier. The IOM's findings um, in unequal treatment that was published, um, I think, in uh, 2001, I think it came out, um, found that the disparities are consistent across a range of of uh, demographics. It doesn't matter if it's a provider setting um, or across disease areas or even socioeconomic, that the disparities by, by race, that these things exist. And they're found when uh, other factors are controlled for. So it's complete and it's been going on for, for quite some time. Uh, we could see that in a more recent report from, uh, was published just last year, but figures I think going back to 2011, that there has not been a lot of progress made, that literacy is still poor, and that there's very little change over time. And while some uh, disparities are getting better, um, by and large, minorities are suffering. <coughs> to see why this occurs, we have to go back in time a little bit. And um, we'll look at Abraham Flexner's 1910 book-length report on the state of medical education in the US and Canada, the famous Flexner Report. Many aspects of the present day American medical profession stem from the Flexner, the Flexner Report and its aftermath. The report called for American medical schools to enact higher admission and graduation standards and to adhere strictly to the protocols of mainstream science in their teaching and research. The impact was disproportionately felt on minority schools. The report's recommendations resulted in the closure of five out of seven predominantly black <coughs> medical schools. As described by Sullivan and Mittman, viewing blacks as a source of infection and contagion, Flexner feared that blacks living alongside whites would <coughs> communicate infectious diseases such as hookworm and tuberculosis to their white neighbors. His vision for the extent of practice of the black doctor involved not research or academic leadership, but instead, the task of maintaining principles of hygiene, and sanitation, and civilization, rather than surgery, this, in turn, he projected would increase infectious diseases among blacks and therefore limit the spread of the diseases to the white population. How very nice of him. And we could see the aftermath still. That when we look at diversity in the health professions, there is not a lot of movement with the exception of the Asian American community. Uh, these numbers go back to 2008, but they're not much better now. We could still that we're predominantly white. Uh, these are the medical school applicants, about 6.8% African American, mostly female. There's, there's a shortage of, of black American applicants to, to medical schools. 
the disparities are worse among the faculty. Well, we'll see, um, these are the graduation rates <coughs> by ethnicity, and we see that there hasn't been a whole lot of movement, um, except you know, the, the most movement has been made recently by, by Asian Americans. The disparities are worse among faculties, and this creates a problem because there's no mentorship for, for younger faculty, and there's a lack of scholarship. Now, the, the lack of minority providers and mentors has a palpable effect on clinical interactions, as demonstrated in this study by Saha and colleagues. This study of racial concordance perceived uh, and perceived quality demonstrates the importance of these racial and clinical and cultural factors. For example, black patients were more satisfied with care received from black physicians as opposed to physicians from other races. And white patients reported that they weren't happier, but they felt that the white doctors were more skilled. Um, there, were, there, were, there was nothing qualitative here um, to say why they felt that way. Um, but in a similar way, patients were more likely to rate um, racially concorded physicians as excellent as opposed to physicians who, who were not. And it's hard to say what's happening here because past studies have indicated that minority populations receive disproportionately large amounts of care from racially concorded <coughs> providers. So this could be just what people are used to. It could be what people prefer uh, because of thoroughly eroded trust in the system. Uh, of course, there could be some bigotry at play or some combination of all of the above. Regardless, race has consistently been shown to play a role in the satisfaction of clinical encounters. Although the literature describes benefits of racial concordance in the wake of the Affordable Care Act, it's just not sustainable, not with the shortages and disparities we see with health workers. While concordance meets the goals of fidelity to patients, cultural competence serves the need for autonomy and, and beneficence. A culturally competent health center should have a diverse staff, have bilingual, multilingual staff or translators available, provider training about the people whom they're serving, accessible signage and instructional literature, and culturally specific healthcare settings. In other words, cultural competence needs to be a core institutional value. In our increasing multicultural society, there's a need for competent communication between patients and providers. Communication effectiveness is crucial in this area due to the risk of misunderstanding, misdiagnosis, dissatisfaction, and, and, and death. It could also lead to provider stress and job dissatisfaction. To alleviate these problems, providers must become competent intercultural communicators. Empathy, bilingualism, and intercultural experience go a long way here, and training is necessary. There's little time allotted in residency to address these issues, and physicians self-report that their preparedness to deliver this sort of care lags well behind clinical and technical areas. Cultural differences in the encounter take their toll on the provider-patient um, provider relationship. In Shouten's view of differences in cultural communication between white physicians and minority patients, considerable differences in and difficult differences and difficulties were revealed. There were less effective behavior such as displays of empathy, rapport, build, rapport building, and responsiveness. There are noticeable differences in instrumental verbal behaviors as well, such as giving explanations, interviewing skills, and communicating about antidepressants. Minority patients, too, were less verbally expressive and assertive when faced with a white doctor, although explanations for and consequences of these differences were seldom included in the studies, it's enough to say that there were large gaps in communication, just in case we needed any empirical evidence of this. But we have to ask ourselves, how can we address this? Uh, can virtue be taught? Are medical schools schools of virtue? And the virtue philosophers, such as Aristotle, thought that virtue has to start much earlier. It's, it's, these are values that are inculcated within, within, within us from a very, very young age. So it doesn't make a small difference. It makes all the difference whether or not people have certain values by the time they even come to medical school. But medical schools still do try, with some success, to try to train their, their 
their students in this. And we can see in this, in this Zanetti um, pathway study, where they, they came up with the, a cultural uh, competence curriculum, they found that the, the students who had participated were more comfortable. They, they considered their competence to be higher, although studies show that the providers tend to think they're more competent than their patients do. But even still, the confidence is, is good. And um, their, their priorities were different with regard to how to treat patients, where to practice, and, um, and their style of doctoring in general. And in a review of these studies, there, there has been shown to be a benefit by outcome. And we could see that using what I assume is <coughs> evidence-based medicine, evidence grade A, that you know, provider knowledge is improved. Provider attitudes and belief are changed by this sort of changing. So there's hope. If we can get more types of these training for providers and for students, that there can be some meaningful change in these areas. Implementing cultural competence into clinical practice has been challenging nonetheless. Lack of consensus as to what cultural competence is and how to operationalize it and access it. Culture is often reduced to matters of race and ethnicity, largely ignoring the rigid hierarchical culture of clinical environments. Looked at this way, it becomes difficult to identify and harmonize values of those in care. Evidence-based practice provides an answer to some of this with a three-pronged approach, using evidence-based medicine to promote standardization of care to reduce disparate care, provider expertise, and incorporating patient values and circumstances in decision-making. Evidence-based practice is supposed to bring together this top-down and bottom-up interventions and um, bring cultural competence to the bedside and the care of the patient. The concept of evidence-based medicine is a process of systematically finding, appraising, and using research findings as the basis for clinical decision-making. It's a process of continuous evaluation of knowledge and the best way to wield it. EBM is portrayed as the facts of medicine, a value-free approach to knowing what really works. It does not directly ascribe to any particular theoretical foundation in ethics, but some scholars have argued that it's consequentialist in nature. It's utilitarian in that it looks at the goodness of consequences for the greater number, as for the for the greatest number. Excuse me. As described by Dr. Mona Gupta, the basic principle behind evidence-based medicine is that interventions that are shown to have a positive effect on large populations will, if applied to individual patients, <coughs> likely lead to improved health outcomes for those patients. The moral significance of evidence-based medicine, then, lies in its ability to achieve morally right outcomes as defined as, defined as improvement of health or achievement of certain health states. This is not to say that the deontological or virtue ethics have actively dismissed it. However, the central purpose of EBM practice is not to foster clinicians' views or enhance our actions or duties, but rather to achieve certain ethically desirable consequences. This has led <coughs> patients, at least, to have certain uh, therapeutic misconceptions, uh, such that all care already meets minimum standards and that medical guidelines are inflexible and prevent their doctor from giving the treatment that they want to provide and that more care, newer care is, is better and that more costly care is better. There's deference to the physician, not to the researcher, but the, the physician at the bedside. And scholars have talked about the potential for bias. Despite the potential and actual <coughs> benefits these biases or the potential for such exists. Research conducted in areas with commercial value can be biased towards generating return on investment. Minority groups, women, and other groups whose health issues have been underrepresented in research face the same, if not more, bias in treatment as research does not reflect their needs. Technical bias allows researchers to work in areas that only they know how to work in. And publication bias exists in that many cases only that in many cases, only positive results are published and that results in, in large gaps in knowledge. <laughs> For example, on average, industry-funded studies um, are more than four times as likely to show clinical effectiveness of drugs than neutrally-funded studies. 
although EBM is supposed to uh, is supposed to support the move away from paternalism in favor of patient autonomy, shared decision making and informed consent, there are a host of ethical issues that must be addressed. Evidence-based medicine has been criticized as an example of consequentialism. Its proposition that the worth of an action can be assessed by the measurement of its consequences. One, many outcomes cannot be measured. Two, it's not always clear whose interests are being assessed in, are being considered in assessing these outcomes. And three, conclusions may be thought to be unethical from other points of view, and EBM doesn't really provide a mechanism for resolving those types of ethical issues. There's also considered to be an over-reliance on randomized controlled trials, which have limited value in the primary care setting. The argument here is that evidence-based medicine ignores the individual patient because the randomized controlled trial represents an average effect of trying a treatment on a large number of subjects. Therapeutic equipoise is also challenged because there must be a valid question as to the, the, value, the value and validity of an intervention that's, that's being studied. And this can prove difficult when there's great benefit to be gained in the commercialization of uh, an, an intervention or a medication. Philosopher Maya Goldenberg has pointed out um, that evidence-based medicine, despite its claims not to be value-laden, really, really is. And she states that evidence-based medicine's ability to guide healthcare decision-making uh, by appealing to the evidence as the bottom line is attractive to many because it proposes to rationalize a complex social process. Yet it does so through the positivistic elimination of culture context, contexts and the subjects of knowledge production from consideration, a move that permits use of evidence as a political instrument where power instruments can be obscured by seemingly neutral technical resolve. She adds that the formal methods promoted by evidence-based medicine replace the so-called traditional medicines over-reliance on intuition, habits, and unsystematic clinical experience appear to repeat the, uh, repeat the same misplaced effort to separate science from values. And Goldenberg goes on to conclude that the appeal to authority of evidence that characterize evidence-based practice does not, in, does not increase objectivity, but rather obscures the subject developments that inescapably enter all forms of human inquiry. She doesn't... <laughs> She doesn't like EBM. Considerations of distributive justice give rise to a fear that research can be used as a basis for coverage or reimbursement decisions and rationing. Some have claimed that this form of medicine doesn't fit well into primary care, uh, as well into primary care as it does into secondary and tertiary care. This is due in part to the nature of randomized control trials and their better fit with single disease states with well-defined symptoms, while primary care is messy and may relate to complex psychosocial problems. It also pits the patient's interests against the larger societal and, and policy interests, considering the aggregate instead of the individual when trying to decide what is best. It impedes upon both patient and provider autonomy and shifts the balance in medical decision making. Now, Howard Brody claims that what's really happening here is just a power shift between rival narratives. The move to evidence-based medicine was simply a shift in what is seen as or considered to be the best evidence within academic medicine. There was a struggle between the bench and the bedside, and the bench won, perhaps in part because it's much better funded. Regardless of all of this, if evidence-based medicine has even a fraction of the benefit that it's purported to have, it would be wholly irresponsible for us to ignore it. Policymakers, providers, researchers, and yes, medical librarians need to coordinate to translate evidence-based medicine and um, its practices into an accessible content for audience consumption. The message must be tailored to meet the needs of the audience, not the other way around. And um, th there's been, within medicine itself, um, among clinicians, there's been debate of, about it there's, in this power struggle, uh, where there have been claims of objectivity. There are also claims that there are problems creating guidelines when evidence is weak. And also, that uh, the efficiency that's 
being created uh, really ignores the individual technique and it's, uh, it stifles innovation at the bedside. Um, the, the call to, to limit idiosyncrasies of practice may also serve to de-skill providers that, that uh, don't have uh, the best evidence available to them. And the call that we're going to have better informed patients is just the result of limiting patient options. And so we're not informing patients any better. We're just telling them, telling them less. And um, the basis for public policy, there's also this fear that third parties can use these guidelines to, to limit care to, to people based on, uh, based on coverages. So it's, we, have a matter, we have a question of who's, um, whose values are controlling here. The values driven by calls for efficiency, quality control, and cost savings are similar to what we've seen with health information technology. In that arena, financing has been probably the most important factor in adoption. Without the financing, we would not have medical records the way that we would. In fact, before the meaningful use plan and the kickback of money to providers to implement these systems, implementation rates were abysmal. And then once we started to see that there was, there was meaningful use incentive and money going back to providers for implementation, the rates shot up in implementation. Before that, there were billing systems and administrative systems, but there were not a lot of use of clinical decision support or the use of medical records, electronic medical records. Business goals lead to business benefit. Lower costs generally mean then larger profit, not consumer savings. This is why we've seen code creep. Every time billing structures change from fee for service to pay to performance to, to manage care, now accountable care, at every step we see code creep. And that's because the computers can game the system much faster than regulators can patch the loopholes. Aside from that, when it comes to electronic medical records, there's major usability and quality and accessibility problems of clinical information. My, uh, some of my physician colleagues refer to their EMR as the billing document, and that's, how, that's what it is for them. Health information technology is an artifact of the medical industrial complex that Arnold Roman warned us about some 35 years ago. There have been major benefits in financial and administrative function, but problems are rampant. Confidentiality was one of the first victims, and uh, Mark Siegler discussed this, where in the traditional relationship, we have clinician, we have patient, and they're exchanging information, and confidentiality is within that dyad. Now, 100 people may be looking at a record between all the clinicians and administrators and staff that need to get in a record to do something. So while it may not be a breach of confidentiality, certainly the notion of this dyadic confidential re relationship needs to be re-examined. There's also usability to coordinate care. There are major problems with, with that. Um, the quality of information is not great. We see cutting and pasting and lots of volumes of information that make information inaccessible within the record. There's also the triadic relationship to consider where the computer is, might as well be a person in the room. It physically creates a barrier where my doctor doesn't look at me and it's the, the way he set up his office, but I sit there, he's standing to his side. I'm sitting there, I can't see his computer screen and he didn't get the type of training that taught him how to use a computer within the clinical encounter. And so there is this barrier. There also is, from my perspective, the, 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 one of the biggest problems in the, modern, in the modern record is with the loss of the narrative and charting. And uh, there's a good example of this provided by Eugenia Siegler when she gives a, a good description probably from before the turn of the century of Landry's ascending paralysis. I think this is actually Landry's description of it. Um, you, you get a sense that this is an observation, that this is a clinician that's looking and observing things and recording the observation so he can go back later and look and see it over time. So this is what it looked like then. Now this is what you're going to see. This is a much different form of communication. And in the eyes of some, this is interested in billing. This is not trying to give meaningful information about what's going on with the patient. This is showing that it took a long time, it had a high degree of complexity, and I want to get paid.
And there, there have been calls for more use of social media and electronic health. But if disparities exist outside of information without it being electronic, the, the same disparities are going to exist with electronic health information. Moreover, people don't have, not all people have meaningful access to technology, and those same people may suffer from other literacy problems. It's the, the same groups of people. Um, moreover, research has shown from Pew over the course of many years that um, minorities and those from lower socioeconomic strata do not seek health information online. So putting that type of information out to people is not really the best way to go about it. Moreover, they still have the same literacy skills, and so the information is not readily accessible uh, in, the, in the way that it's um, constructed. So we're expecting more and more from patients than ever before. And diminished literacy means diminished autonomy and decisional capacity. Autonomy seems to be more of an obligation than a right. The goals and methods of decision making are constantly swinging and the values of patients, providers, and the public constantly shift the weight of authority. To provide informed consent, patients require knowledge of the relevant choices, but different stakeholders find different information relevant and meaningful. Are decision makers always best off with more information? And that's a question I constantly ask myself because even clinicians can have information overload. And, and so we turn alarms off of EMRs because we, we have to restrict the amount of information we take in. And so we have questions that arise, especially when it comes to end of life and futile care. What types of options should we be offering? Clinician values and interests mediate the way that information is reported, used in interventions, and communicated to patients. The 30-day surgical mortality reporting provides an example of this. There's an unconscious bias, or a conscious one, that accompanies this requirement. Surgeons who report concern about this type of reporting are, <coughs> number one, more likely to decline to operate on a patient who has a DNR, or two, more likely to refuse to re withdraw life support until the 30 days have passed. Um, and this, this is more, you know, it's, they are more likely to do this than surgeons who do not report concern over this type of reporting. So this creates a bias in the evidence that's supposed to assess surgical safety. This is a conflict of values that impacts the, the, the needs of, of, um, of, of patients. And to be clear, there, there's no safe harbor. Even the field of ethics, where I'm branching out into from law, which we won't even talk about law and ethics, um, there, there, there are major problems. Bioethics and bioethics scholarship has been normatively white since Hippocrates. And it's, it's, it's from Hippocrates to Percival to Pellegrino, one after another we have this inculcation of what is now Judeo-Christian values, and we call it bioethics, and it's not a very diverse crowd. When I go to bioethics association meetings, I'm stunned. And when I bring these issues up at ethics committee meeting, it's I could hear the crickets. It, it's, it's the thousand pound gorilla in the room. Nobody wants to talk about it. It makes people uncomfortable. And so I've started teaching a class that addresses these types of issues and I bring my students with me every time. Because then the, at least somebody else will chime in and, and talk about these issues. So we could see it, that doctors use their, their knowledge and their values differently. They consume healthcare differently than ours. And there were a couple articles that were written in 2012 that were about this. One of them uh, was by Ken Murray, who discussed why doctors died differently. And it had to, he was talking mainly about how their knowledge of interventions about what works and what doesn't work really goes to inform the care that they choose for themselves. And I've, I've seen this with, with uh, clinician family and friends who have gone through this experience and um, it, it, things change for them. Once they experience the, their own mortality, they, they were giving very different advice to patients than they, than they found that they wanted to give to themselves. And it really was an eye-opening experience. Now, this is, can be sometimes troubling. And I've, um, uh, this article I, I was particularly troubled by. Um, uh, clinician bias is largely unchecked and it's palpable. 
were unaware and in some cases insensitive to the blind spots that we have. And the would-be exemplars, people like Emmanuel, uh, Dr. Ezekiel Emmanuel, um, provide a, a really, really good example. So, so he, he was making the claim in this Atlantic article that he will consume less health care after he reaches the age of 75, not even flu shots. His argument that is that aging is more expensive than youth due to the likelihood of incapacitation and disappropriate, uh, disproportionate use of resources. We spend more at the end of life than at any other point. Um, that alone is not problematic. And it's been said before by uh, ethicist Daniel Callahan from the Hastings Center is uh, one of the notable people who sent it, uh, who said that, but he abruptly changed his mind when he reached his chosen terminal age. And he's in his 80s now, so uh, good for him. Uh, and I'm okay with that too, um, because we should all be able to change our minds. Uh, certainly, this is no different in my perspective from the problems we see with any advanced directive. Trying to make a present decision um, for something that's going to happen in the future. It's very, very difficult. And so we don't want to be held to our DNRs because, you know, if you're once DNR, not always DNR. But where things take a turn is in his justification. And it, he, it seems that what he argues, but it's only for himself, he says, this is just for me, is that we have less of a right to health care as we age. Because he goes on to say that um, people are less creative after their 40s and don't contribute as much to society. And he cites the age of Nobel laureates and um, sci when people make scientific discovery. And if that's the standard, well, just kill me now. I mean, I, either that or you're really lucky because I'm 45, so I'm at the height. You guys are getting me like right, right at the critical moment of my life, but probably, I'm not going to have a Nobel Prize. I mean, I'm not gonna be on the level with, with someone like him, but neither are most people. And, um, so even if we're not to believe that this is his personal, if we believe that this is his personal outlook on life, which he's publishing in the Atlantic, and by the way, he's one of the chief architects of the Affordable Care Act, um, it, it shows a, a real insensitivity. He should know better. He, he really should know better because this has real implications for the elderly and, and for people with disabilities or those of us who just want to sit around and play video games. I mean, we, we still have dignity and agency, and I'm not sure his article uses either one of those words. But we still have, we still have some uh, work to do here because in the reality of do-everything medicine that some patients call for, there has to be a way to stop because we have limited resources and we can't get, do everything for everyone. There's an ever-present tension between autonomy and paternalism in this regard, and that's fighting for the soul of healthcare for providers and patients. <coughs> the growing role of autonomy and decision-making has had unintended consequences to say the least. Physician, uh, physicians began to abdicate their expertise in making complex medical decisions and defer to patients and surrogates. To account for this, some physicians call for paternalism in communication, such as palliative paternalism, to determine what the proper level of patient autonomy should be. The idea is that less autonomy, the less autonomy that a patient has, the less information should be given to that patient. In other words, futile interventions are taken off the table. The problem here, when I look at the criteria, is that many of the markers for low literacy and disparities are also what they're saying are risk factors for maladaptive coping at the end of life. And so this could really contribute to the disparities and, and literacy issues. But there's also the, the, the reality of the medical and social models of disability. And this is kind of reflected in... Um, in Ezekiel's paper and um, in, the, in the previous slide where in the medical model of disability, we have an individual and the, the disability causes the impairment. And that impairment, that physical impairment is what limits somebody in society. But in the social model of disability, which is what the disability rights community ascribes to, the, the disability is the social barriers that uh, 
that it's the environment that it's not accessible. It's, it's not the impairment that creates it, it's society. And if you look around the world and the differences in which disabled persons can, can interact and live in our society, it's just so, if you go to Europe, there's, there's just no way. They, they don't have, they don't have, people don't have the rights the way that we do here. Go to Russia and see how disabled people live. It, it, I'm sure it, will, it won't be pretty. The medical model of disability and the manner in which those values inform clinical communication can have devastating results for those in the disability community. In this piece from the Hastings Center report, William Peace describes his experience with this. Paralyzed since 1978, he's had some intimate contact with healthcare, but his account is shocking. Suffering from a bloody debridement for a severe stage four staph infection, he's been hospitalized. The treating hospitalist runs through the litany of problems and possible, and possible negative outcomes. The, the hospitalist is hanging crepe just repeatedly with him. He's going to be bed bound for six months. The antibiotic may cause organ failure. Um, there's a very good chance that the wound will never heal. And if that happens, you'll never be able to be in a wheelchair. That means you can never work again and you'll be utterly dependent upon others. If you can even afford to, to have this. And next, right after that, the doctor tells him, if you want to refuse treatment, we can make you very comfortable. So, so here we have palliative care, palliative care for a staph infection because he's disabled. And this is because the values of the doctor and what he considers to be evidence and what the likely outcomes for this gentleman are that perhaps death is favorable to disability. And so there has to be something more. There, there, there have to be more factors than, than evidence and clinical values of the of our clinician values. Evidence and, and societal constraints and also patient and physician factors all need to be incorporated. And I, I believe, and hopefully we'll hear about this later today, this is what evidence-based practice is supposed to be. It's incorporating all of these three to try to create something meaningful and to address cultural competency <clears throat> techniques. Again, we need to have a multifaceted approach of training, recruitment, I don't think you can see that. Interpreter services, um, and, and hopefully all of these things will lead to, to better outcomes. However we choose to go about this, scientific advances must be harmonized and integrated with accepted clinical ethical standards. Some have stood the test of time for centuries, as evidenced by the fact um, um, as evidence and fact have come and gone and come back again. I'm referring to the ideals of respect, empathy, and commitment to the social contract of medicine. This stuff is meaningful, even to those doctors like Dr. Osler up there, who presided over a predominantly paternalistic system. Information cannot be a surrogate for care. People are rarely moved to action on the basis of fact alone. Respect, dignity, participation, and emotional satisfaction are essential components of successful motivation for action. Clinical skill can only take us so far. At some point, we need to care for the patient as a person and not a heap of values and symptoms or a simile. There is no r randomized controlled trial for human dignity that I know of. That can only be found with the patient, the N of one. Thank you.